You've probably heard the word holy before, or at least sang it in a church song once or twice. And for most people, this idea is really just connected to being a morally good person. So God is holy because he's morally perfect. Yeah, that is part of it. But in the Bible, the idea of holiness is even bigger and more rich. What it's really describing is how God is the creative force behind the whole universe. He's the one and only being with the power to make a world full of such beauty and life. And so all these abilities, they make God utterly unique, which is the meaning of the word holy. So a helpful way to think about God's holiness is by using the sun as a metaphor. The sun is unique, at least within our solar system, and it's really powerful. It's the source of all this beautiful life on our planet. And so you could say that the sun is holy. And you can actually take this metaphor even further in that the whole area around the sun is also holy. Yeah, because the closer you get to the sun, the more intense it gets. Yeah, exactly. So that very power and goodness that generates all this life is also dangerous. I mean, the sun, if you get too close, will annihilate you. And in the same way, there's this paradox at the heart of God's own holiness. Because if you're impure, his presence is dangerous to you. And not because it's bad, but because it's so good. And so the first time we see this paradox of God's holiness, it's in the story of Moses and the burning bush. So God tells Moses to take off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. And Moses covers his face in fear, and God says, hey, don't come any closer. It's intense. It's actually that intensity of God's holiness that's explored even more in the stories about Israel's temple, which was the main place where God's holy presence was located. And at the center of the temple was this room called the most holy place. It's the hot spot of God's presence. And whether you're an Israelite living in the land around the temple or a priest working right in the temple, you're in proximity to God's holy presence, which is dangerous. Yeah, this is a problem. So how's it supposed to work? Well, in the Bible, the solution is that you need to become pure. So like being morally pure. Yeah, and that's easy enough to understand. But the Bible spends a lot of time talking about another kind of purity, being ritually pure, which is a state where you separate yourself from anything related to death, like touching things like diseased skin or dead bodies or even certain bodily fluids. All these make you impure. And becoming ritually impure isn't necessarily sinful. What's wrong is waltzing into God's presence when you're in an impure state. And so that's why God gave the Israelites very clear instructions for knowing when they were impure, steps to become pure, so that they could go into the temple again. So that's what the book of Leviticus is about. Right. But it doesn't stop there. This idea keeps developing. So later in the scriptures, we find this really interesting story by a prophet named Isaiah. And he has this crazy vision where he's in the temple and he's right in God's presence. He's totally terrified. Yeah, he knows the rules. He shouldn't even be in there and he's worried about being destroyed. And then this crazy creature called a seraphim. Yeah, that is a crazy creature. <laughs> totally. So it flies over with a hot coal, and then it sears Isaiah's lips with the coal and says something really weird. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. So this burning coal somehow makes Isaiah pure. Yeah, it's remarkable because normally if you touch something impure, it transfers its impurity to you. But now here's this new idea where you have this coal, this very holy and pure object, and it touches Isaiah and it transfers its purity to him. Isaiah is not destroyed by God's holiness. He's transformed by it. I mean, the implications of this are just huge. But there's one more development this time from another prophet, Ezekiel. And he has this vision where he's standing at the temple and he sees water trickling out from it. And then that water turns into a stream and then it grows into a deep river that starts flowing through the desert, leaving this trail of green trees behind it. And then it flows into the Dead Sea, making everything fresh and alive. So instead of becoming pure first and then going into the temple, here God's holiness comes out from the temple, making things pure and bringing them to life. What does it all mean? So we don't know until we meet this man, Jesus. And he claims that he's fulfilling all of these ancient visions, but in surprising new ways. So Jesus, he went around touching people who are impure, people with skin diseases, a, a woman with chronic bleeding or dead people. And when he touches them, their impurity should transfer over to Jesus. But instead, Jesus' purity transfers to them and actually heals their bodies. 
Jesus is like that holy coal in Isaiah's vision. Right. And Jesus claimed that he was the human embodiment of God's own holiness and that he and his followers were now God's temple so that through them, God's holy presence would go out into the world and bring life and healing and hope. And so this is why Jesus described his followers as having streams of living water flowing out of them. So this is our part of the story where we find ourselves now, but where's this all heading? So the last pages of the Bible end with a final vision about God's holiness. And this time it's by a guy named John. And in his vision, we see the whole world made completely new. The entire earth has become God's temple. And Ezekiel's river is there, flowing out of God's presence, immersing all of creation, removing all impurity, and bringing everything back to life. Charlie, did you say I don't need to preach now? That's fine. Let's go home. <laughs> anyway, the, yeah, the Bible Project videos, you could watch those for sermons and you would be just fine, I think. Um, and I wanted to begin this morning uh, with that video because it really helps us to get a, a picture and to situate us and today's story. And I apologize. I gave Alicia the wrong passage to read. So um, we're going to have to read today's passage. But... Uh, and that's my fault. Um, but I want to situate today's story by using that video in really kind of the biblical, social, religious context that Jesus was coming into, especially as he came down off the Mount uh, of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is Matthew chapter 8. And I got my Gospels mixed up, it looks like. I had her read Mark chapter 8. So apologies for that. So if you turn to Matthew chapter 8, here's what it says. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof of to them. So for a few minutes, what I want to do, and what that video I, I hope helped us do, is get an idea of this, this biblical picture of holiness and purity. And for a few minutes, I want to situate us as well in, in regards to the, the particular malady that this man uh, comes to Jesus with. This is the first man that Jesus encounters after he has preached this great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. This is the first person that comes up to him and interacts with him. And we're going to see Jesus interact with a lot of people, but this is the first one. So there, there's a significance to it just in that sense. So as he comes down the Sermon on the Mount, he meets what's called a leper. So we need to answer, answer the question, what are we talking about here? And I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Noah, who's now going to come up and explain leprosy to you. Just kidding. Stay right there. <laughs> so I want to I want to define without any medical terminology. Well, I have a little bit of medical terminology. Um, exactly what we're talking about here, which isn't exact, and that's one of the points here, is that it's important to define these words. But unfortunately, these are pretty imprecise words as they're handed down to us in the scriptures. Uh, it's, this is the kind of imprecision that actually drives Doctor Noah crazy when you're talking about medical things. Um, and the words leper and leprosy became these kind of catch-all words that were used to describe actually a variety of skin diseases back in the day. And most notably, if you do open to Leviticus 13 and 14, which you don't need to do right now, but you can go home and read it, these diseases are described in kind of confounding detail. But most importantly, the term leprosy did not necessarily refer to the disease that we think of as leprosy today, which has the medical name of Hansen's disease. Um, but there, there, so there really is no precise medical diagnosis for what the scriptures call leprosy, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And the main point is that we would be aware that when Matthew calls this man a leper, he speaks of leprosy, 
It might refer to a variety of different skin diseases. That would, and this is the important part, these skin diseases would make a person ceremonially unclean. It would make them ceremonial or ritually impure. Okay, so I'm going to use the words leper and leprosy, but I'm not necessarily referring to, to what modern, in modern medicine we would call leprosy. Now, interestingly, the, the Hebrew word that's used in Leviticus and that gets translated as leprosy into English, it comes from the, the Hebrew word to mean strike or to hit, to strike or to hit someone. And the idea is that someone would be stricken or hit with a disease. And oftentimes the idea was there is there that they were stru- stricken by God with this disease through di- divine means. And so in several instances in the Old Testament, when it talks about leprosy, uh, there's several stories in which the skin disease was given to someone as a judgment on their sin. So in Numbers chapter 12, uh, we have Moses and Moses' brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam. And they come to Moses critiquing him, basically critiquing him for this woman that he's married. And they, they basically ask him, are you the only one that God has spoken to? Hasn't God spoken to all of us as well? And, and this is the point in, the, in, in Numbers where Moses writes that he's the most humble man in the world, which is kind of funny to me. Like if I wrote that, eh, I don't think so. Um, but his humility is on display here because he just kind of closes his mouth and God shows up and intervenes for him and says, look, Moses is different. I meet with him face to face like I meet with a friend, okay? You all get to be in my presence, but Moses is different. And then he strikes Miriam with leprosy and all of a sudden her, her skin is just white and covered with some sort of skin disease. And Moses intercedes for her and says, please don't do this to her. And God says, look, you need to put her outside the camp for seven days, just like you would with any, any other skin disease, and uh, that's going to be the judgment upon her. In 2 Kings chapter 5, there's a story of a Syrian general named Naaman who has leprosy, who has a skin disease, and he's looking to be cured, and he finds out that there's a prophet named Elisha in Israel, and so he goes to Israel to try to be cured of leprosy, and he goes there, he is cured, and he offers all this money and all these rewards to Elisha. And Elisha says, no, I don't want to have anything to do with those. Go back home. So he goes home, but it, Elisha's servant named Gehazi sees an opportunity here, and he goes, man, there's all that stuff. I'm going to go get some. So he sneaks out, and he goes to Naaman, and he says, hey, uh, Elisha said you need to send me with some of that stuff. So, you know, Naaman gladly gives it to him. Gehazi comes home, and he sees Elisha, and Elisha goes, where you been, buddy? He says, oh, nowhere. He says, well, I know where you've been. And because of that, because of your greed, you're going to be struck with leprosy, and so are your descendants. It's this crazy judgment on Gehazi because of his greed. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, we, we meet King Uzziah. And King Uzziah was the king of Judah for a long time, And over the course of time, he became very prideful, so prideful that he thought that as king, he had the right to go into God's temple and approach God with with the offerings that only the priests were supposed to approach God with. Well, the priests who were there confronted the king, of all people, in the temple. He said, you can't do this. And he said, I can do whatever I want. And instantly, leprosy broke out on his skin he turned white. They watched it happen. They said, you got to get out of here. And they ushered him out of the temple. And he was a leper for the rest of his life. So that's a, a little bit of a picture of, of what happened uh, in the Old Testament, what leprosy was. It's a variety of skin diseases. And it was, it was a picture of some sort of God's judgment, although that wasn't necessarily always the case. Now, the bigger picture, though, is that Leprosy had to do with cleanness or ritual purity. It was, it was considered a defilement to, be, to have a leprous skin disease. It was considered a pollution or, or a disorder of the body that rendered a person unclean. So if you go back again to Leviticus 13 and 14, the diseases that are labeled leprosy are, are given space not for medical reasons. Leviticus isn't a medical textbook. It's a book for the priests 
so that they know how to worship God and allow a people, an unholy people, to live in the presence of a holy God. So it's about ceremonial or ritual purity. And instructions are given for how the priests are to deal with people who have these diseases, these skin diseases, even how to, how to deal with a house that has some sort of outbreak happen within the house so that they could rule on someone, whether they were clean or unclean, not really if they were sick or healthy. It all had to do with cleanliness and un- uncleanness. So on the whole, Leviticus, and, and I've always called Leviticus the graveyard of good intentions for those who want to read the Bible from front to back. You usually get to Leviticus, and that's where your good intentions get planted and stay forever, right? We get to Leviticus, like, what are we even talking about here? This is crazy. So it's famous for being an Old Testament book that's really difficult to understand, but it deals really with the specific problem of how does a holy God dwell with an unholy people? So, So an individual might be morally impure for some reason or another. Maybe they've committed some sort of sin, either intentionally or unintentionally. Or they might be ritually, ritually impure. So, so like the video said, they could have a skin disease or they could, they, their mom may have died and they have to get the body ready for burial. And in that sense, because they've touched a dead body, they're ritually impure. Or they've touched a bodily fluid or something like that. Or they've eaten a ham sandwich. Okay, that would be breaking the kosher laws and becoming unclean. Any of these things would make them ritually impure and bar them, at least for a time, from approaching God, from from coming to the tabernacle or the temple in worship, and it would require some sort of ritual sacrifice to restore them to, to a place of purity or a place of cleanness. So being clean or unclean then had to do with, with whether or not someone could approach God in worship. And then another concept that comes along with leprosy is this concept of separation or isolation. For, so for those in Israel who were, who were diagnosed with one of these skin diseases that's described in Leviticus 13 and 14, they had to be quarantined, and they were quarantined by placing them outside of the camp, away from the rest of the community. So Leviticus 13, verses 45 and 46, here's what it says. It says, The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. And he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! And he shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Then in Numbers 5, after the people have received the law and they're getting ready to to move towards the promised land. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous or has a discharge and everyone who is unclean through contact with the dead. You shall put out both male and female, putting them outside the camp, that they may not defile their camp in the midst of which I dwell. And the people of Israel did so and put them outside the camp. As the Lord said to Moses, So the people of Israel did. And the the symbolism and the reality here were pretty stark. Okay, so being unclean resulted in in kind of a virtual death of sorts, a death through separation. And this this separation had, had at least two effects. The first effect was that the leper was physically and socially separated from their community. So they were isolated. They were, they were forced to live alone. They couldn't fellowship with their family or friends. They were cut off from all of their relationship. And over time, this, this separation, over the thousands of years between Moses and Jesus, this, this separation would lead to this culture of outright ostracism for anyone who was a leper, a social stigma that, were, that was placed upon them because of their disease, because of their uncleanness. So lepers basically were full-on social outcasts. The second result or the second effect that this separation had is not that it just separated them from community and relationship, but it separated them from the worshiping community. 
So their uncleanness actually barred them from approaching the tabernacle or the temple. It, it excluded them from involvement in worship in any way, shape, or form. They would come to be seen as, as cut off from God, as under God's judgment. Now, now think about that just for a moment. If you came to church and there was somebody at the door saying, sorry, you can't come in, you're unclean. How would that make you feel? On the, other, on the other side of that, in light of this, it's honestly shocking to me how, how often we easily separate ourselves from the worshiping community and, and we don't think anything of it. We have other priorities, or, or maybe we're busy on Sunday, so we separate ourselves from the church and from community and from worship. And this leper that Jesus meets here in Matthew chapter 8 would have given up everything to be able to return not only to his family and his community, but to be able to approach God in worship. And sometimes we, we treat it so lightly. The he Hebrews chapter 10 tells us don't neglect the gathering together of the saints so that you can come and encourage each other towards love and good deeds. It's always a privilege. It's always a privilege to worship with God's people. And the final point I want to make here just about leprosy and what it is is, is the point that, that only God makes clean. Only God heals. And this is a, a major implication from several Old Testament stories that deal with these kinds of skin diseases. And, and, and God is the only one with the power to heal and make clean. So, uh, for instance, when, when, when Yahweh, God, meets with Moses at the burning bush, and he says, I want you to go to Egypt, and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go, and to bring them out into freedom. And Moses, you know, he puts up, no, I'm not going to do that. I, I can't do that. I don't speak well. You've got the wrong guy. I'm too old. Go find somebody else. And thankfully, God sticks with Moses. Right? He's patient with him. And then Moses says, okay, when I get there, how in the world am I going to prove that I've been sent by you, God? And so God says, okay, take your staff that's in your hand, throw it down on the ground. And he does that, and the staff becomes a serpent. And he grabs the serpent. God tells him, grab the serpent. He grabs it. It turns back into a staff. And then the next thing he tells him is this. Again, the Lord said to him, this is Exodus 4 or 6, put your hand inside your cloak. So he puts his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. And the idea being here that I'm going to give you these miraculous signs, and when somebody sees these, they'll know that I have sent you. And so the idea that God could give leprosy and God could instantly take it away proved that God was with Moses. This is something that only God can do. Going back to that story of Naaman, the Syrian man, the leper in 2 Kings chapter 5, who comes to Israel, and with, when he comes, the king of Syria sends a letter to the king of Israel, which basically says, hey, here's my servant, Naam, servant Naaman, he has leprosy, please heal him. And the king tore his clothes, it says in 2 Kings chapter 5. He tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? So even this evil king of Israel was able to recognize that God is the only one who has the power to heal from leprosy. That will become important in today's story of the leper and Jesus. So, so behind all of this story of Jesus and this leper, just ca captured just in three short verses, is an entire cultural, religious social history that infuses this story with profound power. And the, and the most shocking part of this story may be the fact that this man had the gumption to actually approach Jesus. He approached Jesus in boldness. Because according to Leviticus, this man, if he was approaching anybody or anybody was getting close to him, should have been crying out, unclean unclean and keeping his distance from anyone but instead it tells us that he approached Jesus he takes a calculated bold risk and comes 
to Jesus. And that decision, that, that approach could have been met with strict punishment. I mean, Jesus, as a rabbi, could have said, what in the world are you doing? How dare you come close to me? Disciples, pick up your rocks and start stoning this guy because he's broken the law. The man approaches with boldness. He takes a great risk. But he also approaches Jesus in worship. In verse 2, it says, Behold, a leper came to him and knelt. If you have the ESV or other translations like the NIV, that word knelt, the word is translated knelt. In the King James Version or the New King James that word is actually translated worshipped. And that is the word in the New Testament that is translated worship from beginning to end. This man is bowing. It's not just like he's getting on his knees. He's bowing down in worship to Jesus, giving homage to him as someone who is worthy of his of his respect and his worship and the connection of this action with the first word that he says to Jesus, Lord, points to the fact that this leper had a view of Jesus as more than just a mere man or a rabbi. He recognized that Jesus was worthy of his worship. Imagine how profound a moment this must have been for a man who, because of his condition, had been barred and banned from public worship, and we don't know for how long. He couldn't approach God, but now in this moment, God in the flesh is here, and he approaches and comes to him. How profound would that be to be able to worship face-to-face when you haven't been able to worship for years? His ban from public worship didn't keep him from expressing his worship before King Jesus, which speaks of his faith. He came and approached Jesus in faith. And in faith, he recognized Jesus' authority in two ways. First of all, as I already pointed out, he calls Jesus Lord, which is a, a title of respect and submission. So it shows him that, that, Lord, you have authority. And here's what he says. This is the second way he He notices his authority or affirms it. He verbally affirms Jesus' power. If you will, you can make me clean. In other words, Jesus, if you want to, you have the power to make me clean. Listen to the faith there. You have the power to do this. You can do this. And notice, too, that the leper doesn't ask to be healed. He doesn't say, please heal me. Please fix my body. He says, please heal cleanse me. You have the power to make me clean, to make me pure. He sees himself not as sick, but as dirty, as unclean. And again, because only God has the power to heal, only God has the power to cleanse, this man seems to recognize this authority and power and the identity of Jesus as the one who can do this, as God in the flesh. And so there's something that this man communicates In in how this man communicates that shows a deep faith in who Jesus is is it compels him to take this great risk of approaching Jesus and asking for help, and he knows that Jesus is able. But at the same time, this man is rolling the dice because there's something that he's not quite sure of, and it's that Jesus is willing. He's not quite sure of the extent of Jesus' compassion So there's this question that hangs in the air between verse 2 and 3. Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. And we don't know yet how Jesus is going to respond. So there's this question that hangs in the air between these two verses about Jesus' readiness to help, whether or not Jesus is willing. Will Jesus be like everyone else in this man's life who has turned their back on him, who has ostracized him, who has rejected him, who has considered him cursed by God? Or will Jesus be different? So this man's approach to Jesus, I think, should challenge us in several ways. Are we like this man in that we absolutely trust Jesus' person and his power? And based on that faith and who Jesus is and what he can do, are we willing to accept Jesus' desire to heal and make clean? Are we, are we willing to, to accept Jesus' compassion 
towards us because, as we'll find quickly in verse 3, Jesus is willing. It doesn't take him long to give this man an answer. And stretching out his hand, he touched him, saying, I want to be clean. And it's this compassionate touch, this, this touch that has been held back from this man that would normally risk defilement, this, this compassionate touch displays God's heart of mercy, his heart of compassion. Everyone else in this man's life had fled from him, keeping their distance because, hey, I might get contaminated and be unclean too. But Jesus breaks through all of that and meets this man's bold approach with, with a physical approach of his own. He moves towards this man, perhaps for the first time in ages, touching him. You see, Jesus doesn't cringe from us. He's not scared of our uncleanness. He's not scared of our brokenness. He's not scared of our sinfulness. He doesn't keep us at a distance until we get our act together. His heart is willingly for us. He's the one who reaches out and touches the untouchable. He's reaching out to you as well, even right now. He's ready and willing to meet you where you are and restore you to wholeness. That's Jesus' heart displayed here. His willingness to act on this man's behalf is more, this is more profound than it may appear at first because to cleanse a leper is more than just healing his body. It's restoring him to community, to family, and to worship. So look at verse four. Jesus says this, see that you tell no one, but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. So, so go to the priest and go back to Leviticus 13 and, 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 and bring all the things that Moses required to show so that this priest can take you through all the rigmarole to show that you have a clean record of health. It's another way of Jesus saying to him, I am giving you your life back. So Jesus sends him to go through all these necessary steps to ritually and officially be restored to a normal life within the community. This man would no longer be alone. He would no longer be ostracized. He would no longer be ashamed. And Jesus understands the importance of the dignity that comes for us in being part of a community, in being part of a family, being, being able to come and worship. He understands the importance of that for us. The question is, do we understand that? Do we understand all that Jesus restores us to when he cleanses us and when he heals us? Jesus is willing for you. Jesus is also able. Recall, recall that this man was convinced already of Jesus' ability. He was just unsure about Jesus' willingness. And and Jesus' response displays not only his willingness, but his ability. And, and notice that unlike everyone else in this man's world, Jesus wasn't worried about touching this leper and becoming defiled. Rather, like the video showed, his holiness overpowers this man's leprosy. And, and instead of taking on his uncleanness through this compassionate touch, Jesus shares his own wholeness with this now former leper. Instead of sharing in the man's defilement, Jesus shares all of his holiness with him. And the only way that God can dwell with an unclean people is to make them clean. It's God alone who has the ability to heal and to, to cleanse. So to have power over leprosy was, was to have power over that which keeps us from God. Our uncleanness, our defilement, our sin. And what Jesus shows us in just these two verses, three verses, is that he has the authority and the power to make us whole and holy. And in doing so, he brings us back to God. So Jesus doesn't just heal, Jesus cleanses. The, the official, like, big theological word in, in the Bible is atonement. He makes atonement. He doesn't just 
fix our physical problems. He fixes our spiritual problems. Jesus removes all the obstacles that keep us from worshiping the Father. The first obstacle he removes is our uncleanness, our sin. The greatest thing we need from God is forgiveness of our sin, and Jesus gives us that. The second obstacle we have, I think, is our own sense of dirtiness, our own sense of uncleanness, our own sense of shame. And then the third obstacle we have is our estrangement, I think, from one another. And when Jesus cleanses us, when Jesus comes and gives us atonement. Jesus takes care of all these things. So through his death and his resurrection, he forgives our sins. And he offers us righteousness and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. In his death and resurrection, he takes our stigma, our shame on himself, and he removes our shame forever. And through his death and resurrection, he restores us to community He places us within a family. And in all of this, Jesus gives us back the beauty and the privilege and the joy of approaching him with one another, free of guilt and shame and and free to worship. So I want to just end by asking the question, reminding us that Jesus had just finished preaching this sermon and now he's going to go into the world and actually live out the kingdom. Live out what, what he's talking about in the sermon. And he, he beckons us to follow him. So what does it mean to follow Jesus from this story? Well, the first thing I think is that to be a follower of Jesus is to have faith. And to have faith is to recognize that Jesus is both able and willing. So when the leper first approaches Jesus, he unabashedly recognizes Jesus' ability. He, he recognizes his power, his authority to make him clean. He doesn't question those things, but he does appeal to Jesus' willingness. And I think most of us struggle with one of those things. Either we struggle with Jesus' ability, but I don't know about that Jesus guy. I, I know he's really nice. I know he loves everybody, but I'm not quite sure he's able to do what I need him to do. Or maybe we struggle with Jesus' willingness. God, I, Jesus, I know you're powerful. I know you can do anything, but eh, I don't know if you hear me or see me or care about me. So the challenge for us is simply to believe that Jesus is both able and willing. His heart is for you. His authority is available on your behalf. So do you believe that Jesus is different from everyone else? And he will treat you with the utmost compassion when we live in a world where very few people treat us with compassion. He will welcome you with open arms when so many people push us to the outside and push us Away, He will allow you to approach him. And not only that, he will approach you. Do you believe that Jesus treats you with the utmost compassion? Because when we trust Jesus, we're not just trusting his power, we're trusting his heart. Do you believe that his heart is for you? And then the second thing I want to bring up as we go about what it means to follow Jesus is to just ask us this simple question. Who do you consider to be unclean who do you see as unclean because lepers were seen by everyone in their society as unclean but jesus doesn't shy away from unclean people which by the way is incredibly good news for each of us it's incredibly good news for you and me that jesus doesn't run away from us but there are plenty of people in our worlds from whom i think we regularly shy away those who are outsiders, those who are unlovely or unlovable, those who we consider unclean or outcasts, who are those people in your life? Who do you look down on or count as outside the realm of your compassion or the realm of your love or the realm of your concern? Who would you never dare to touch for fear that they might defile you? Even if it's just they might defile your reputation. They might cause other people to say things about you that you don't want to be said about you. 
Is it those people you look on as unclean, or is it, is it gay people? Is it straight people? Is it trans people? Is it homophobes? Is it liberal people? Is it conservative people? I'm just going to make a list here. Pick which ones you want. Progressive people, fundamentalist people, Democrats, Republicans, alt-right, woke left, black lives matter, white lives matter, Biden supporters, Trump supporters, pacifists, militarists, refugees, homeless people, billionaires, addicts, Californians. <laughs> we found it. Okay. Just say this, Jesus is not afraid of any of these people. He loves them with his whole heart. He wants to approach them and for them to approach him. But he's not here right now. But guess who is? We are. And he wants to approach and love the people that we consider unlovable, untouchable, unapproachable. He wants to approach them and love them and touch them through you and through me. So what does it look like for us to love people like Jesus loved this man? As we come to the table again today, we are remembering Jesus' approach to us who were unholy, unclean, in our sins, rebellious, treasonous enemies of God. He has approached us, and through his death and through his resurrection, he has made a way for us to be clean, to be forgiven. And so as we come and as we take if you're a follower of Jesus, you're welcome to come and take a communion. You can take it alone or you can come with others or with family members. And remember as you, as you take the, the bread and as you take the juice, we're remembering Jesus' body and his blood, what it cost for him to approach us so that we could approach God. He gave everything down, gave everything away. He prayed the price so that we could be made clean. And that's what we remember as we come to the communion table today. So let us together approach God. Come in worship. Approach the table because God has come after you. He loves you. He cares about you. He wants to be with you. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful for Jesus, the one who has come and has touched the lepers, who has touched the unclean and the outcast, who has brought holiness where there was none before, who has brought submission where there was rebellion. You have brought, Jesus, forgiveness where there was sin. You have brought life where there was death. You have brought togetherness where there was aloneness and isolation. You have removed shame where there was shame. You have taken away guilt where there was guilt. You have made children out of enemies and rebels, and we just want to worship you today. Jesus, thank you for opening the door to God's throne room and inviting us in to worship our Father and making us able to do just that. And so as we come to the table, God, would you speak to our hearts and remind us not only, Jesus, that you are able, but that you are willing, that you want to reach out and touch us, draw us in, be with us forever. We praise you for this. We're grateful. We're incredibly grateful. We thank you for all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.